All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is a special, very special espresso shot um, workshop that we're doing this morning. So you guys know that we typically have, I do this every time. Why do I not learn? I don't know what the heck. <laughs> so this is, as I said, a special espresso shot uh, workshop this morning. So we typically have a Sunday morning workshop that would be Sunday brunch, and that's every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific. But this morning, I'm really excited because I have a friend of mine who's actually here in San Diego. She's uh, actually, you still are, right? Because I know you do travel. So yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Lynn Marie's all over the place, but she, I met her in San Diego. Um, and she's got a really, really, really cool um, subject to share with us this morning. And so we're in the midst of goal setting and goal getting month. But Lynn Marie is going to have us take a look at our goals and really evaluate them and, you know, just kind of look at them with a really like, critical lens to make sure that we're actually on the right path, that our goals are actually aligned with where we want to be going to make sure um, beyond that, <clears throat> excuse me, that there's nothing getting in the way of those goals as well. So, you know, there might be things that are kind of working against you and your, you know, your plans. So we're going to take a look at all of these different things and we're going to talk a little bit about Lynn Marie's story. She's got a really interesting one. So I think you guys are going to appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so Lynn Marie, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much for having me. I really, I'm, I'm really glad to get to talk to people who are, you know, the side hustler type, like-minded people that already are like goal oriented and, and know that they're sometimes have to do things that are challenging to get to where they want to be. Exactly. And, you know, side hustlers, I always say this too, like we are, we don't have the same 40 hours a week um, that maybe a full-time entrepreneur or 60 hours or whatever it is that, you know, people are putting in. We don't have all of that time to give to a business. You know, we're working a full-time job. Um, and so we're doing our, our side business in the mornings or in the evenings <clears throat> on the weekends. Um, you know, so we really need to be critical about how we spend our time. It's really, really important. So I'm really glad that you're here and you're going to be helping us uh, kind of work through this because I feel like Sometimes one of the biggest challenges that side hustlers face is really just trying to do it all, trying to get it all done, trying to take on so much. And then it ends up, you know, people, you know, burn out and they get frustrated. And you're a side hustler yourself. Is that right? I am. Yes. I, my, pr my primary job is I work as a physician in the compensation and pension department at the VA. And then I have a, a second job where I do nonpartisan digital media PR um, mostly for election reform campaigns, those two nice. seem nothing related, but that's what I do. You know, that's where the, the regular salary comes in. But on the side, I started a website that helps people learn how to do strategic quitting and not only just learn how to do it, but learn the importance of it. And through that, I wrote a book. And so I'm in the process of pre-selling the book, which is something that we do to try to attract publishers so we can get a publisher for the book. Um, or I may end up self-publishing either way. But that's where my real, I mean, I have lots of passions, but that was an area that my side hustle, like for many of you, fulfills that passion that wasn't being covered with my other careers. Yeah, exactly. Um, because, you know, we are multidimensional people. You know, we're not just one thing, you know. So I love that. I love the fact that, well, and you're probably the most, when I think of somebody who's like a complete multi-potentialite, someone who has <laughs> so many passions, like, and you're good at all of them. So you're, you're like the first person that jumps into my mind when I think of somebody who is like that, like talented on that many different levels. You're too so. kind. <laughs> well, Thanks. yeah. And for folks that don't know, um, I am uh, a returning capoeirista. So I took a little bit of time off, but I'm actually back training now um, doing this crazy Brazilian martial art called capoeira. And that is actually how Lynn Maria and I uh, originally met um, several years ago. Um, kicking things and yeah, <laughs> trying not to get hurt, but you know, <laughs> kicking around each other, <laughs> mm -hmm. kicking around each other. Exactly. Exactly. So let's see here. All right. So um, if you're watching the replay, go ahead and drop an R in the comments here and we'll be taking questions. So, you know, even if you're watching this later on, you're watching the replay, uh, we'd love to get some questions here and Lynn Marie is going to come back around and she'll answer everything for us. So just be sure that you tag her if there's something specific that you want help with. Um, but yeah, so aside from being a capoeirista, 
and a doctor and a lawyer and all these other good things. Um, yeah, Lynn Marie is also an, uh, the author of a new book, Quitting by Design, and she's going to tell us a little bit more. She's got a special um, offer for us that she's going to tell us about toward the end of the broadcast. Um, but yeah, so Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky is a physician, attorney, and lifelong quitter. Um, through her Quitting by Design website, she helps people carve out successful lives through st strategic quitting. Her goal is uh, to destigmatize quitting and illustrate what a useful tool it can be in cre creating a fulfilling life. Um, when not helping people through their quits, she's a physician at the VA, which she just mentioned, um, an adjunct professor of health law at Thomas Jefferson School of Law in San Diego, and the project manager at a nonpartisan digital media firm focusing on election reform. So I love it. I love all these different passions. Kind of you're, you're able to represent all these different things in your life. It's so cool. Um, and outside of medicine and law, Lynn Marie trains the Brazilian martial art of capoeira. She plays guitar and bass. Okay, you've won up me there. I play guitar, but I don't play bass. <laughs> it's and easy. she can be found uh, salsa and tango dancing around San Diego. It's awesome. Thanks. And you're also a henna master. You do henna too so, <laughs> for people. That's accurate. I would show you, but it's kind of fading. <laughs> <laughs> Super cool. So maybe you can give us a little bit about uh, your story, kind of tell us where you're coming from and how quitting has played a role in, in your life and in your career. We'll be happy to. Um, so I started off, like, like Tracy said, I'm now a, a physician and a lawyer, but I didn't start off as either of those. I was a multimedia designer. Um, actually, I was a video editing major in college. And then my first job out of college was a multimedia designer. And um, I'd fallen into it kind of based on the creative side of it, but this is, you know, the late nineties, I'll age myself and um, date myself. And uh, at the time it went from like, oh, you know, like you just need to know a little Photoshop to make a good website to like, you need to know some Java and C++ and some hardcore, hardcore coding skills. And I didn't have those skills. And I remember one day going to like a okay, I'm going to go to this Java workshop. And every single minute in the workshop, I was like, I'm miserable, I'm miserable, I'm miserable. And I thought to myself like, well, if this is my future and I'm miserable in class number one, let's reevaluate. And I was only 20, I think, maybe 21. I was halfway through grad school. I was like getting a multimedia master's at the point. I thought, oh man, like this is not good. And I, and I looked at my own parents, my dad had hated his job his whole life, but it was a family business. He'd inherited it. So I know what hating your job can, you know, do to your disposition. Yep. And, um, I thought, well, okay, back to the drawing board, you know, um, video editing. I live in St. Louis. It's not, there's not that much opportunity there. It's not Hollywood and multimedia wasn't working. And so that was my first major quit. And a lot of things that took place during that quit gave me kind of the confidence and courage to make other significant quits in my life. Um, at that point, I, you know, told my dad, you know, the person who was, had paid for my undergrad college education, like, I don't want to do this anymore. And luckily he was supportive and he said, you know, well, figure out what you want to do. So I like wrote down everything from florist, chiropractor, anything. Florist, really? Oh yeah. That's like, <laughs> so I don't know. I don't even, I, I can't keep a flower alive in my own. <laughs> but, you know, I decided like, that must be the opposite of, you know, C++. It's <laughs> just cutting flowers. It sounded really romantic. Um, but yeah. No, I, I get you. Thing, right? Like, this is like a straight up blank slate. And yeah. and I, I started looking at each thing and, and I was like, okay, you know, financial security, yes, no. You know, I mean, we did not grow up with a lot of money and I was like, need more security than me being really bad at multimedia. And um and my dad, when I talked to him, he's like, I always thought you'd be a doctor or a lawyer. And I was like, okay, well, you know, throw those on the list, maybe. <laughs> and um, and uh, finally, I kind of went through everything and I decided, well, sports medicine doctor is what I want to be. And it wasn't like, I just want to be a doctor. I was not going to make the same mistake twice. I was not going to pick the wrong career twice. So I didn't want to just go into medicine and hope that I liked one of the paths. I shadowed a sports medicine doctor, found out everything I thought I could about sports medicine. Yep. And, you know, and I called my dad back and I was like, I'm going to become a doctor. And he's like, I meant lawyer because he definitely thought like I was never going to be able to handle the blood, et cetera. But I was not. <laughs> and that path is long. I mean, I had not even done pre med. So I had to do pre med and then med school and then residency and fellowship, which total took a decade. And this is where the side hustle um, theme of goals comes in because I had one singular goal to become a sports medicine doctor. And the path there was 10 years. And I knew that going in. And to me, the sports medicine 
doctor life, you know, was this light at the end of the tunnel. And I think a lot of the side hustlers have that, you know, we think, okay, if we just have this one thing, which might be our goal is being able to quit our main hustle or our goal is to get published or whatever, whatever the goal is. But it's like a lot of times you just put your head down and you just barrel through without really reevaluating along the way. Um, So I realized I was supposed to like tell you my whole story, but really that's like most of the important things come somewhere in, in that first beginning part where I had to have the courage to totally quit what I was doing, start something. I mean, who knew if I would get into medical school, only one in three people actually gets accepted. I only got accepted to one out of 30 schools I applied to. So, you know, that was a real leap of faith and I got lucky. Um, preparation meets opportunity lucky not just you know (laughs) yeah I mean don't sell yourself short and I I love that you said that you know you shadowed somebody you really you were not going to make the same mistake twice and you shadowed a doctor and you actually you know really tried to like do the thing that everybody tells you all the career coaches tell you and it's like I did that yeah yeah and what's what's funny is that I did that and it still failed essentially um because so for our goal setting and goal evaluating introduction, as I'm in that 10 year path, you know, I'm, I'm in pre-med and I like pre-med because it's, you know, nerdy school stuff. Love that. Great. Sign me up for more school. <laughs> then when I got to med school, you know, I'm dissecting bodies. It's not as bad as I thought it would be, but then I get to like the actual patient care and I did not like it. Mm. And everybody else you know, we do rotations in medical school for, for two years. So every month you're doing a different specialty, urology, family medicine, gynecology, et cetera, radiology, pathology. I worked with a medical examiner at some point, like almost anything, you know, you may want to do, you get to try out. Yeah. And I disliked all of them. Oh no. Like, yeah. <laughs> and like you, you would talk to your friends and be like, okay, what residency do you want? You know, what specialty are you going to go into? And most of them would be like, I can't decide. I like them all. And I was like, oh. <laughs> you were like, I can't decide. I don't like any of them. <laughs> right. I was like, well, <laughs> no. You know, I picked sports medicine six years ago. That's yeah. what I'm going to do. But sports medicine is a fellowship, which is like a subspecialty of a specialty. So you have to go into something else first. And so I had to decide what's that thing I'm going to go into first. Um, and the one that seemed like it would set me back, set me up best for family medicine or for sports medicine was family medicine, mm. but I did my family medicine rotation. I didn't like that either. And I just kept saying to myself, and this is where I want the side hustlers to like, hear me. I kept saying, but when I get to sports medicine, it'll all be fine. Like at the end of that tunnel, at that light, all of this, you know, annoyance that I have with patient you know, and patients and the way that our healthcare system is set up and all these things, they'll be gone because I'll just be, you know, standing on the sidelines of some sporting game in my little, like, you know, Under Armour polo and waiting (laughs) for somebody to, you know, bruise themselves on the field and I'll run out there and this is all going to be amazing. And that's where I'd like to start in, in telling people about, you know, evaluating your goals is if you have that many signs of like that, you know, what I always say is, okay, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. That's how your, you know, your goal is, but how painful is this tunnel? How long is this tunnel? You know, mm-hmm. like right now I'm promoting a book and I'll be very uh, candid about the fact that like, it requires a lot of self-promotion that I is way outside of my comfort zone. Right. I'm not used to promoting myself. I'm politically active. I'm used to promoting other people or other campaigns, you know, I do PR, but, oh, promoting myself feels really uncomfortable, but the pre-sale campaign is 30 days. My tunnel of discomfort is 30 days long. Can I handle that? Yes, of course. No, no problem. The medical, you know, to get to sports medicine, that was a 10 year tunnel. And I never stopped and looked around. I never checked in with my gut. I I just was like, I was just convinced that the end goal was going to be some kind of nirvana, totally different from how the tunnel was. And that's what I want you to look at side hustle friends, like look at, look at your goal. And if everything that you're having to do to get to that goal makes you queasy or anxious, or you're just not fond of it, or, or if the reason that, you know, your side hustle isn't going very quickly is because you put it off to the end of the day, because it's your least favorite thing. There you go. Yeah. It may be time to like reevaluate whether that goal is the nirvana you think it's going to be. Right. So, and good morning, Jesse. He's here watching us. Um, it's really good to have him on. And I, I want to invite everybody, even if you're watching the replay, to think about this. Think about a time where you were in that situation, you know, and tell us about it in the comments. Tell us, you know, did you set sights on something 
um, you know, and where you were, you were focused was on this endpoint so far in the distance. Maybe it was a job. Maybe it was, I don't even know. It just could be like anything. Um, or maybe it was just like running a marathon. Um, actually, somebody who we had on a couple of weeks ago, Brittany was talking about running this race and she had set it as a goal and she's like, I'm going to run this race. And she's like, got part way into it and was like, I hate running as it turns <laughs> out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I would love for folks to, to think about that. Think about a time in your past or maybe right now, um, you know, where you're focused on something that seems, you know, so amazing, but the path to get there is not everything that you thought it would be. And maybe, you know, there are signs that you're noticing. Yeah, absolutely. I like how you brought up the fitness goals because I will go ahead and, and hopefully she does not mind. My lovely sister-in-law, she has done fitness competitions and she's great at it and she looks amazing. And she was telling me like, I'm thinking of doing another one. And as I'm hearing her talk, she's like, oh, but I'm, you know, she's a real estate agent. She's like, I'm going to have to go to this, um, you know, gathering real estate agents and not really socialize because I can't eat anything they have there and, you know, can't have a drink with anybody because of the prep. And then I'm going to have to go home and meal prep. And then the, and I was like, um, okay just for a second, let's go over how much of this stuff you're hating. And like, what's the reward at the end? Like how, you know, yeah. I mean, like you get to be on stage for a few minutes and you get, you know, and, and you may well win, but like, what is the cost benefit analysis here? You know, how much you're giving up in this long yeah. tunnel of three months of prep for like, you know, this, and I'm not trying to do, you know, like if your friend finishes a marathon, there's no demeaning that accomplishment, but sometimes you just have to evaluate like, is it worth this, you know, medal I can hang somewhere, a trophy I can hang somewhere for, for what I'm going to suffer in the meantime? Right. Because there's an opportunity cost to it too. And that's something that I always talk to my clients about is that when you say yes to something, you're effectively saying no to something else. Um, and I actually had a recent experience with a client who, um, you know, we thought we were going in one direction with a, a new side business and he landed his first client, got the work, and realize I don't want to do this. <laughs> so did a complete about face and now we're working on something else. Um, but yeah, sometimes that's what it takes. It's like, you actually have to be confronted with, you know, what it's actually going to take. You actually have to have whatever it is right in front of you. Like for Brittany, who did the uh, workshop a couple of weeks ago, um, the running goal, she actually had to put the shoes on, get out there and start running to realize I really hate running. <laughs> True. Not for me, but then to have, you know, to be brave enough and to be honest with yourself enough to identify those things and then actually quit, you know, and sometimes that's the hardest part just to admit, like, I don't like this. This isn't for me. Yeah. I'm not going to have that metal hanging on my, you know, whatever wall. Exactly. And that, um, that's one of the things that I go through in the book is, you know, you may get to that point and you may realize you need to quit. And then there are all these blocks, you know, a lot of 90% of them, legitimate but mental blocks they're, they they yeah. you know um for example like a lot of times quitting you know like a marathon or whatever that's not going to affect you financially probably if, if anything it will probably help you financially because you're not going to be spending all the money on the marathon or the travel or the shoes right. or whatever the shoes <laughs> yeah, yeah. The shoes. but <laughs> but a lot of times it's that what are people going to think if i quit and um tracy did this cool thing in the in the lab that most of you probably saw was she asked people for their first like knee-jerk reaction when they hear about quitting and the majority of the responses were negative negative. and i i love that because it, it's a great you know it gives me something that i can actually talk about because if everybody's like oh quitting is is just transformation you know this would be a short combo but yeah. that's what i like i start off I, the very beginning of my book talks about semantics you know a friend of mine said we've all lost something at some point in time in our lives and nobody wants to walk around and be called a loser, but technically we have lost, you know, like, that's great. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I was like, that's, that's true. And, and that's what's funny about the fact is that nobody does that. Like, I mean, have I lost a game of chess? Sure. You know, does anybody walk around like Lynn Murray? What a loser. No, you know, not, not that I know of. Um, but when it comes to quitting, people think, oh, but if I quit this thing, I'll be a quitter. No, I mean, te technically, semantically, yes, but he will also be a loser, but we all are. Like, we just, you know, that's like, do you leave, like, how much do you focus on this one very small semantic thing? Mm -hmm. Or, and, mm -hmm. and what's, what's sad about, you know, somehow the way that phrases stick in our society is this whole quitters never win, winners never quit thing is so yeah. prevalent and so repeated and so not true. Um, that once people decide they're going to quit, then they're like, but I'm going to be a quitter and quitters never win. Winners never quit. And then it's like a downhill spiral from there. And like, yeah. 
you know, if you got nothing else out of this conversation or reading the book or anything else is that like that statement isn't true and you can totally transform your thinking about quitting just by changing the semantics. Like it's transforming, you know, you're, if I was a doctor and I wanted to quit medicine altogether and do law, I would just be transforming my career. I wouldn't, you know, I, oh, she's a quitter. No, like another great forward. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you go to, <laughs> and that's cool. <laughs> yeah, if you go to like Hollywood and you are a bartender because you're waiting for your big break and then you get your big break. So you quit the bartending job. Is anybody like, Oh, what a bartending quitter? No, they'll say you've made it. You know, it's yep. all just about how things are phrased. You know, when you quit, so those of you who make your side hustle into a main hustle and you quit your main job, is that what you're going to be focused on? Like, oh, what a quitter. They quit that job. They hate it. No, you have successfully hustled your way into a, like a job you really like. So step one in combating the stigma is just like looking at semantically, like, no, quitting, quitting is just what we call it. And we've given a negative connotation to it, but it's super necessary and there's nothing negative about it at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a matter of reframing it because you're right. You know, when, um, yeah, when you do get ready to quit your day job and start your own business full time, you know, you've leveled up. And then in that case, the quit has a really positive kind of, I don't know, everybody's kind of patting you on the back and it's like, yes, you know, I finally get to quit. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's all a different, it's just the way that you look at it, but I know that probably most folks here can relate to this, you know, growing up, you probably always heard like, don't be a quitter, you know, like I can remember, you know, joining some sport or something as a kid and being like, I really hate this. And my parents being like, well, don't be a quitter. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you're right. I should probably stick with this thing that I just don't like. Yeah. Right, what, right. what kind of lesson does that teach us? And you know what? I think it's no wonder that, that most of us carry that into adulthood with us. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, you know, I always say to my parents, like, this is, you know, one of the best things you ever did for me was never stop me from quitting. They never, like they never, I tried softball. I have no coordination in a <laughs> ball containing sport. And I went through one practice and I got nailed in the shoulder and everybody cheered like, yay, you stopped the ball. And I was like, Bye. <laughs> um, quit. And like, seriously, like we, I made it through one thing of softball and then I got into gymnastics instead. And like you said, I love that you brought up opportunity costs. It's one of the two economic theories that I always bring up in quitting. I can't do softball and gymnastics. Gymnastics. I still use in Capoeira today. I'm still flipping around at age. Yep. You're amazing. I gotta tell you. (laughs) Um, softball, you know, I could still be using it on some league, but I hated the first day of it. So I'm going to guess I wouldn't have loved the rest. Yeah. Had I stuck with softball, I would not have been able to get into gymnastics. There's only so many hours in the day. We only have so much energy. Spend it on something that is a goal that's worthwhile. So folks, if you have a question for Lynn Marie, or if you want to share your experience of quitting, or if you are faced with something right now that's kind of on your mind or burning on your brain, and you want to get uh, Lynn Marie's advice or input on that, go ahead and put it in the comments. Um, We're definitely here um, to have this be more of a conversation. And so we've got Ashley with us and it looks like we have Emily joining us as well. So it's good to see you guys. Um, Also, if you're enjoying this broadcast, feel free to hit that heart button, hit the like button. It's, it's good for the algorithm. It allows us to boost this video up higher into folks feed so they can come and join us too. And Jesse said, um, I made the basketball team in grade school. I hated it, sucked at it. Uh, But my dad and coach were best friends. (laughs) Oh, this, there are always obstacles. <laughs> yeah, as I say, like if quitting were easy, I wouldn't have to write a book on it. People would just do it and, um, and that'd be it. And every, nobody would be stuck in anything in life. Um, a friend of mine called settling. And I put this right in the beginning of the book. He referred to settling as suicide of the soul. And I was like, Ooh, dramatic, but, but true because a lot of us settle for things And a lot of it is for so many of these mental reasons, you know, or, you know, yeah, because your parents want you to do something or there's some other relation wants you to stay in one thing or the other. But, you know, settling, especially in a job now that we're adults and it's 40 hours plus of our week, you know, man, to not enjoy that giant a chunk of your life. If you really just like map it out how much of your life you're going to spend in your job, it's just too much to be unhappy for any other reason like any any I mean if that one job someone's house somehow happens to be the only thing that can make the salary that you need to keep you and your family alive okay fine um 
the chances of that are low, but I, under, you know, I never want to ignore actual financial and, and personal realities. Like yeah. I, I don't by any means go say, okay, everybody quit everything you're doing. Just quit it now. Don't think about it. That's the whole point of strategic quitting, you know, so that you end up in a better place than you are now. And not that you quit and you're like, I don't have that job anymore. Yay. But I'm homeless. Like, I don't want you to be in that situation. Anyway, we're looking at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs here. Like you have to be fulfilled. You have to have food and shelter and all those things. Um, but unless that is the one job that will keep you alive, you know, you should definitely reevaluate um, whether or not you stay there. Because as I talk about in the book, it, your happiness level in your job or, or relationship or all these other things that are potential areas for a quit affects every other area of your life. Um, so like say you're in your main hustle now and you're thinking about quitting. You may be at the point where you can, and your main thought is like, oh, but what if I let down my team at work or let's put my boss in a lurch, this and that. Well, those are very valid concerns, but I also would flip it around and say, like, if you are miserable in your job, are you probably the person who's going to be the most productive and best at that job? You know, opportunity cost for the company too. They can only have one person in your job. Wouldn't mm -hmm. they probably want somebody who really wants to be there? Who's really fired up about it. That's you know, point. yeah. You like, it's all about reframing because, you know, we live in this, us centered little brain we have and like, okay, everybody on earth is thinking about me and my quit. You know, that's your first thought. All anybody think about is what a quitter I am and how much I've let everybody else down. Like it's, you know, we have this negativity bias and we also have a personal bias. And I want to point out that most people are not thinking about you ever. Um, for one second, when they hear about your quit, they may be surprised. They may be dismayed. They may be overjoyed for you. Um, but that's probably the most they're going to think about it unless they are your partner and they live with you or they're your, you know, parent or your child, they're, they're probably not going to like, okay, I'm going to spend a good hour today judging Lynn Marie on her quits. Like it's just <laughs> what people are doing with their time. And most so people know. Yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> yeah, you should probably that. not spend an hour thinking about what other people are going to think of your quit because they are not spending that hour thinking about you. And so while you're sitting miserable at your job and you're like, I should stay here for another 40 years because other people are going to think I'm a quitter. Like, please. <laughs> or because, oh, how could the company go on without me? You know, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Guess what? Life will go on. Life will continue. You're not as indispensable in most situations as you may think you are, which, you know, okay. That might be like a little blow to, to the ego for some folks, but at the same time, it's really kind of, I think it's kind of freeing. It's kind right. of like, <sighs> so one of the things I do at my day job I'm not planning a quit <laughs> for anybody that's watching. I am not planning a quit my day job. <clears throat> um, but the one thing that I really believe in is making sure that there is no, you know, um, I guess tribal knowledge or anything that I have in my head that I can't transfer or that I don't transfer to my team to make sure that folks can actually get along without me. And the reason for that is because if I go on vacation, Hey, you know, everything should not come to a screeching halt. So I think by doing that, you know, so maybe we could talk about preparing for a quit or, yeah. I don't know where we kind of want to go with this. If it's more like how to, how to determine. So we kind of just, we touched on the signs and the symptoms that you're ready for a quit. We touched on that. What are the best things that you can do then once you've identified that you are ready for a quit? Okay. Uh, just to retouch on the signs in case anybody missed the beginning, uh, look at your own kind of health flags and your own gut check. Like, are you having a hard time falling asleep? Do you feel anxious all the time? Maybe headaches, maybe back pain, anything that, that is one of those kind of signs of stress that we may not realize, check in and think, uh, did I have insomnia before this job? Is it just when I started getting a new boss and things started going south? Mm. Evaluate. And then also just kind of the dread, you know, whether or not you have any physical symptoms, but you're dreading whatever you're doing. So those are two ways to evaluate. Like, are you on the right path? Is this goal the right goal? Or is what you're in currently the right situation? But prior to quitting, there are some areas like, like you said, that you should prep. And I, those generally for me fall into preparing relationships for a quit, preparing your health for a quit and preparing your finances for a quit. And you also touched on uh, quit, quit preparation, I, I would say timing wise. And we'll get to that first because I don't want to forget about it. But the way, the how and when you should quit of strategic quitting are um, how should be as gently as possible with burning the fewest amount of bridges and the when rolls into that a lot. You know, if you are going to quit a job, 
I wouldn't do it like the day before you have a giant presentation for a bunch of investors. <laughs> um, you know, like you are not going to make any friends doing that. The story is going to be like, oh, Lynn Marie left. She totally left us in a lurch. And I have been there and I have actually had to leave at that time in, in a in a situation where I thought I, you know, where it was made out that I was indispensable, but sometimes, you know, then again, it's your cost benefit analysis, like how much damage is whatever stress you're going through doing to you versus how much damage yeah. you're going to do to the company and how, how devastating it will be if you burn these bridges, you know, always a consideration. But if you aren't in a place where your health is in imminent danger and you can wait another few weeks until, you know, the end of that quarterly review or until that big presentation is made, that's probably in your best interest. Um, but the preparing the other things for a quit, start with relationships. You know, you want to make sure that your partner is on board. Um, but you also want to make sure that your relationship is stable enough to take whatever instability may come from quitting because it, it you know, it can be really rough, especially if, you know, you're quitting a job and then you need to like maybe start a second night job to make up the money that you aren't going to make from your day job while you're trying to find another day job you know, you don't need any additional stress. Like all, all of life success boils down to like, you know, are you still happy and healthy? And those two things are kind of super entwined. You know, it's really hard to be super happy when your health is deteriorating. And it's hard to be super healthy when your happiness is deteriorating. So focus on, you know, you're going to go through a tumultuous time, potentially. If you're quitting, like a, I, when I quit grad school, there was really no tumult to quitting grad school. I just didn't go anymore. You know, I just had to pay back whatever I'd gone through, you know, but I was then going to like start pre-med and start having to study for the MCAT and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of more studying. You know, if I'd been in a relationship at that point, I would have had to discuss with my partner, like, okay, I may see you less. Um, we may have less time to hang out. Are you on board with this goal? And that's when, you know, a lot of people that I talk to today, they, they may be in fine relationships, but their partner's not necessarily, you know, totally down with their new goal or a new direction they want to go to. And so then there's like another quit you may have to evaluate, you know, is this, is this partnership going to be the best for me in my future if they don't support my goals, but get your relationships as, as stable and in order and get your partner as much as you can on your, you know, support team, because it's not going to be always easy. Um, preparing your health for a quit logistics. If you're quitting a job that gives you your health insurance, just on the most basic level, get every last exam you can before quitting, you know, just economically, like, please go get your every blood panel that they want to draw on you. Just, you know, do it, get poked and prodded 4,000 times because, you know, you may not know when you have insurance next. I mean, I have, I buy my own, it doesn't come through work and a lot of us can, but you know, there may be lean times where yep. you're not able to. So that's on the most basic level, get whatever you can done. But on another level, like I said, to make it through what's kind of a tumultuous, stressful time often, it's best that your health, you know, for your happiness to be at its max, your health has to be at its max, which means you should have your sleeping schedule down. You know, don't go into a quit with this, like I go to sleep at 2 a.m. and I get up at 6 a.m. and I'm, you know, kind of a walking zombie every day because I barely sleep and I don't ever exercise and I eat like fast food because that's what's around. Like that is not going to set you up for success. You, you should, you should focus on success as a whole person and to be a whole successful person, you need to have a full night's sleep. You need to have healthy eating habits. You need to exercise that, which that will help you, you know, not only with your health, but with your stress level that keeps your, you know, keeps your happy hormones flowing. So health wise, get everything in place before you make that quit. Don't make the quit and be like, okay, once I quit, I'm going to have time to get healthy. No, because it's your, then you're going to have to be job searching or whatever else is going to be your excuse for why you don't have time, you know, get it. That's a great point. Beforehand. Yeah. And then financially, I had the great fortune of having two, I, I, I am a quitting, a quitter collector, let's say. And <laughs> I have, cause I love when, you know, friends come to me like, I quit this thing. I quit this other thing. So two of my friends were CPAs. And one became an actor. He's been on NBC. I'm very proud of him. Wow. And yeah. And um, the other is now a lead brewer at Mission Brewery. And oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so I know. Cool. You're a beer fan, so I figured you'd I like am. that. I yeah. don't hide that. Yeah. <laughs> really wearing her Modern Times beer shirt. Oh, um, yeah. Just call me out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So yep. they both decided, I have a new passion in life. It is not finance. I am going to quit. And I, you know, and they both quit successfully. 
And so I went to them and I said, you know, you're, you're finance guys, give me your best tips. And so the actor's tip was look at what you're making in your current salary job, then take out taxes, take out, you know, like start doing the math. You know, if you have a salary, but you're working 60 hours a week, then, you know, use that 60 hours a week to, to do the math and look at what you're actually making per hour. And then help use that to kind of help you re-examine what may be, let's say beneath you in a job that you may need to take as a transition. If you're like, Oh, I can't, I can't work as a barista. That's, you know, I can't go to making $15 an hour, you know, something low. You may not have been making that much more before. Like once they took out everything from your paycheck, et cetera, et cetera. And he said like that helped him kind of, uh, through times where he's like, Oh, well, I, you know, this, this job doesn't make that much or whatever, but you may need to take those types of jobs as a buffer in the interim. And he said, just kind of reevaluate how, how much of a pay cut that those jobs really are, you know, and, and it's all, if it's all for the greater good, again, this gets back to your tunnel. If you're going to have to work as a barista for 10 years and you think the money is terrible and the lifestyle is terrible, then maybe not the choice for you, you know, but right. that was his tip is just look at what you may actually be making and, and your interim jobs may not be that, you know, and that maybe not even interim jobs. Maybe you want to be a, you're a doctor now and you want to be a florist, like we were talking about. And you're like, oh, but the pay cut, you know, well, look, if you're working 60 jillion hours a week as a doctor and you get to work 35 as a florist, you know, like the, the pay might not be that different when it comes down to hourly. Exactly. And then my friend who is the uh, brewer, he gave what I love. One of my favorite tips is before quitting his CPA job, he worked to live off of half his salary. So, and I think, I think I'll have to ask him, uh, but I think it was at least six months that he did this, if not more. Um, but this has two giant benefits. One, it shows you, you can, so that when you take, if you, if you take a big pay cut, if this is a job we're talking about, or you may be putting a relationship or a marriage where the financial support came from the other partner. And so it may not just be quitting a job that affects your finances. You know, you may need to prepare for a relationship quit of this type. And the same kind of thing might be helpful. Like, you know, live on half of your salary. It'll show you that you can, and then it'll give you a, a buffer, a cushion, a financial cushion for when you do quit, you have that half your salary from that six months or whatever to live off of while you're making the transition. Yeah. So I think those are some fairly concrete ways that you can make sure that the quit goes smoothly and successfully. Yeah, because I think oftentimes what ends up happening <clears throat> with a lot of folks who are making the leap, say, you know, from a full time job into going into business for themselves is without sort of that runway, um, you know, having runway savings for yourself or being able to, you know, show yourself that you can live on half of your original salary. If you don't have that and you don't have that kind of reserve or you haven't prepared, then what ends up happening is with the new venture, whatever it is you're doing, if you're going into business with yourself, um, on your own now, um, you may not be able to give it as much time. Um, you may not have as much time to let things get off the ground. You may not have, you know, the six months to a year to really let things, the wheels start turning and momentum to start picking up. You may have to fold and give things up because you haven't prepared. Yeah. So that's the other thing. And that's the other reason why side hustling is so awesome. Well, there's a million reasons, but that's the other thing is because you could actually get this thing started while you still are in a full-time job and you could actually have, you know, clients or have business coming in and then be able to kind of, you know, make those adjustments to where, you know, now most of your income's coming from the side hustle and the day job can go bye-bye because you've actually worked up to that point. Yeah. So exactly. I love that you brought that up <clears throat> and the living on half your salary thing has been intriguing to me for a long time. Like it's really been one of those things. There's actually, um, Oh my God, I want to say stacking Benjamins. Um, they, they have a podcast, um, a blog and everything. They had a course on that a while ago that I picked up and it's, it's actually really cool. You can manage to do that. It's like, think about the possibilities, you know, not only just for preparing for a quit, but just, you know, maybe like getting ahead on some of your financial goals. So I love that. And I love that that was the advice from the brewer. That's super cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I want to point out for the side hustlers, like you just said, side hustlers are working more than 40 hours a week. Usually, you know, I'm there with you. I come home from my other job and then I get online to try to promote the book or I, or I would get online or, you know, open the computer to write the book. And that takes a lot of energy. And so getting back to, you know, preparing your health, you, you can't just burn the candle at both ends and, no. and expect to be successful. You've, you know, I go to bed by 
10 30 11 i'm up at the same time every day i work out in the morning i you know meditation in place you get your journaling in place like all of your self-care habits have to be there for you to have the energy to pull this off um so that's you know for the general population maybe not as important but side loss hustlers it's hugely it's actually important for all population but for us in, in particular because we're definitely running the risk of burning the candle at both ends and yeah. then you're going to end up you may end up resenting the side hustle because it's keeping you from sleeping and you're like no that's not <laughs> that's just because i didn't prepare properly so set yourself up for success prepare properly get your health in order so that you have the energy to do both things and you heard this advice directly from a doctor, so you know you can trust it. <laughs> there you go. This is a big theme, actually, in the group. <clears throat> actually, we just had a 14-day challenge here at the end of October, and it was all, all about time and energy management. And so, you know, because it's not just about the time that something takes, it's about energetically, what does that mean for you, and how does it impact, you know, other things in your life and what are the things that you need to incorporate into your week in order to be the best version of you? Like, what are those things that you need? And you just touched upon some of those things, you know, the fitness aspect, getting enough sleep, you know, and understanding that you are doing more than the average person. You really are. And yeah. you're doing something that's not easy to do. So you need to prepare yourself for it. Yeah. I always, I always point out that quits do not have to be major. I have quit so many small things that have been helpful. Um, so in case, you know, you're sitting around and, and I want to point this out for side hustlers and for everybody else, strategic quitting is a life skill to have. It is a self-care tool because yeah. you may not, you're, you're sitting there today, like everything is great. My relationship's great. My job is great. I live in a great city. Don't need to quit anything, you know, click like, no, because something inevitably at some point in time will come along that you need to quit. And it may be the smallest thing. Like, for example, I had an unlimited monthly membership to my yoga studio. It was, you know, 115 or something a month. But when I did the, the math to make it more financially sound to keep the monthly membership than to just pay class by class, I'd have to go twice a week. Do I have time to go twice? I do not. You know, I have tango and capoeira and whatever else that goes on. So I had to quit that, you know, just a little quit. It took the stress out of yoga. The stress shouldn't be in yoga, you know, like that. <laughs> should be your stress you know, when I was like, oh, right. trying to schedule yoga is really stressful. I quit that. And the other main quit that I made and I... I am not at all um, guilty about this. I wave this in a giant flag. I do not cook. I will not cook. <laughs> Cooking does not happen in this house. And I, I order my food delivery. And I don't order like the food delivery you assemble and cook. No, this stuff is ready to go when it shows up once every awesome. two weeks. Because there, like you said, there is a finite amount of time and energy. I do not enjoy cooking. Cooking is the bane of my existence if I did it. And so I decided to quit it. And that quit freed up a lot of time and energy. Yeah, there's a financial cost, but I have decided that the cost of paying for food is less than the cost of me losing time trying to be a terrible cook and trying to go out and buy ingredients and failing at right. making things and whatever else came with it. So look at, you know, just small things in your life that you may want to quit that just aren't working for you. A gym membership, you, you know, like I say, quitting a gym membership doesn't make you like uh, a terrible fitness person and unhealthy, you just go run. Like you can go to your park and do some push-ups. Like there's a thousand ways to get fitness that don't require you to spend a hundred dollars a month on some fancy, fancy gym membership. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you a quitter. It makes you resourceful and, and frugal. Actually smart. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. No, I love that. And you know, for folks that think that it may be, you know, like maybe cooking is your thing. Maybe that's how you de-stress and unwind and maybe you love it. You know, I am like you, Lynn Marie. I don't really like it, <laughs> you know, but you know, if you're going out to eat every now and again, that's outsourcing cooking. Maybe people don't think about it that way, but you're already doing some outsourcing of that if you're going out to eat. Um, but I think, you know, maybe it's something different for you. Maybe you want to hire somebody to come in and clean your place once a month, They'll do a deep clean in your head. It's not that expensive. I actually just got that set up for my mom on the East coast. So she's getting older now and it's getting hard for her. So I actually just got that service set up for her and it's not that much. I was actually shocked. And, you know, cleaning is not one of my favorite things to do either. Um, I do it. But, you know, when I have a bigger place that can actually, you know, justify me hiring somebody, I probably will. Yeah. Just because, you know, to Lynn Marie's point, you know, our time is valuable. There is a dollar figure on the hours we spend. You don't think about it that way. But if, you know, the time that Lynn Marie would spend cooking dinner she can actually, you know, have that, you know, handled by somebody else who's going to make a much tastier, much more enjoyable meal. 
she could put that time into promoting her book or doing the next big thing she's working on. And the same goes for all of us too. You know, it's about choices. It's about decisions. It's about realizing that saying yes to one thing is saying no to something else. Yeah. That's, I love that you keep bringing that because it's so true. And it's the most true for us because our, our, our day is probably packed. The regular hustle, the side hustle, there are just not enough hours to go around and you cannot clone yourself. So not yet. Yes, exactly. I'm sure you're working on your lab, Tracy. <laughs> I'm, I am. It's a secret project. <laughs> and Jesse says, chase after the dream. Don't chase after the money. Yeah. And because there was something that you had said earlier, too, as well. Um, I think it might have been the brewer. Oh, no, maybe it was um, your own example. But just going from being a doctor to being, you know, taking a huge pay cut to something that's doesn't pay as well. But, you know, your quality of life, it means so much more, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. For folks that maybe take a job closer to home because it cuts their commute down and now they've got more time to spend on their side hustle. You know, there's so many different ways to look at this. Yeah. And I, and I, I guess I never really got to the, the clicker or the clincher of the story, but when I got to sports medicine, I hated it. Like the entire, yeah. So there's that glamorous. You weren't able to wear the under armor and stand I, on the sidelines. And I had it. No, I had <laughs> all of that. I had my little, I was a sports medicine doc at the university of Arizona. I had my little uh, blue you know, made out of the nice material polo with my U of A logo here. I traveled to, you know, Stanford with the team and I stood on the sidelines and you could see me on ESPN. Like, the, <laughs> like I was like the, I am the least happy person at this game. You could just see, I was always like, Oh, get the camera off me. I like cannot fake that. I want to be here because it didn't occur to me. Like I, I thought, okay, sports medicine, I can, you know, I can help. Essentially I'm a dancer. So I just really wanted to help dancers. I'd never sat through an entire football game in my life and here I was having to like stand on the sideline knowing what's happening knowing like when we're doing well and poorly and being interested and all I was like just can somebody get hurt so I have something to do yeah, like, so just, funny you know and everybody like that's when I realized man I have a dream job but it is my nightmare like I do mm. not want this and that's you know like like I love what she said there's lots of things I could have done with medicine that would have been chasing the money um Cause I always, I always, I mean, I go back and I think a lot of times would, if I had evaluated my tunnel, would I have quit? Uh, should I have quit? You know, like, and not that I'm uh, regretting. I literally just like go back and think, you know, there were plenty of reasons that I stayed because I end up now I have a doctor job that is not at all like sports medicine. It's much better. But um, I think like, you know, every once in a while that little voice is, you could have done radiology radiologists make so much money you know like three times what I could ever make in sports medicine and I think hmm, dark room all day staring at a computer screen no I would not have gone into that you know I, I'm glad that there was you know I never succumbed to the temptation that's very prevalent in medicine is to just chase the the specialty that makes the most that's a great recipe for a really miserable life mm -hmm. a wealthy but miserable life and you can't buy happiness so yeah, yo, know, definitely. But I like the fact that, you know, you have tried so many different things and you stayed here. Here's the thing that I think you know, might be easy to gloss over here, but I think your example is probably the best example for this. Um, this wasn't a matter of you just finding a bunch of jobs, starting and quitting. Like you were actually on the path. You were actually really focused on something for a period of time long enough to know that, you know, it wasn't going to work for you. Yeah, I think the other side of this is people that hop around and don't give things enough time to really even know, like you don't give something a fair shake. And I see this with side businesses, too. I see people trying to start like three things at once. And I'm like, <laughs> that's a quick recipe to be like, I am not good in business. I, I suck. I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, You know, just pick one thing and commit to it for maybe six to nine months, you know, maybe a year. And if by that point you really don't like it, you don't like it. So what? Try something new. Right. Give the tunnel a fair chance to find out whether there's a light at the end or, or if it's miserable. No, right. absolutely. Right. Definitely. And Cheryl Ann is watching too. So folks, if you have a question for Lynn Marie, let, let us know um, in a couple of minutes, she's going to tell us where we can find out more about her and what she's up to. I know she alluded to a book, so she's going to tell us a little bit about that. Um, and replay viewers do the same. If you have any questions or you have a comment or you just want to, you know, kind of say something to Lynn Marie, make sure you tag her here in the comments and she'll see that. So this has been an amazing discussion. I'm really, really glad we had the chance to have you on. Thank you so much for hosting me. I love to be able to talk to other side hustlers because, you know, I'm right with you. Definitely. Yep. We are the ones who get up early, 
while the world is still asleep. We're <laughs> the ones who stay up late when the world is going to bed and we're making it happen. So just by being here, being in this group, being a part of this thing, like you guys have to understand like how much respect and how much love I have for all of you. Like you guys are, I don't know, just inspiring me all the time and, and giving me the chance to do what I do is just amazing. So just being a part of this whole movement, because I think sooner or later, the world is going to need a side hustle. I think it's just, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, and I think Lynn Marie, you and I might've had this discussion earlier, but it's just smart to, you know, have more than one thing going on and not to put all your eggs in one basket. It is a smart thing. And I don't think we really touched on this, but I think, um, no, we didn't. This is a, maybe could be a, uh, an opportunity for a whole other discussion, but the fact that you have expertise in all these different areas that you've quit makes you somebody who's actually really unique because you have, you know, the intersection of all of these things is actually a really interesting place. Yeah. Um, that's, it's funny that you mentioned that. Well, two things I'd love to touch upon from that, like well, what Tracy was saying about having more than one thing. A lot of times what I said before, if I were to quit medicine and become a florist, I would be quitting the identity of being a doctor. And for a lot of us, we've built our identities around our careers or even around our relationships. I'm a wife, you know, those kinds of, I mean, I'm a I, mom, I'm but yeah, like, a, you know, <laughs> I'm a husband, I'm somebody's partner. And a lot of times part of that mental block to quitting is like, who will I be if I quit, if I quit this thing that I built my identity upon? And so your point, Tracy, was great is that we probably are mostly multifaceted people. And if not, maybe we go out and find some more facets that, that interest you because it's, you know, it, you don't have to just focus on that one thing. If, if I couldn't doctor tomorrow and I couldn't be a lawyer, I'd be a capoeirista and a musician, you know, like there's always something behind the other thing, some other passion. And I, I had this discussion um, actually with my tango partner the other day, this very discussion. And he said, but those things are hobbies. And I said, doesn't your, your identity doesn't have to be built around what brings in the money, you know, like most, a lot of us aren't, you know, you may work at McDonald's and your, your identity isn't like I flip burgers. Your identity is at night, I'm a rock musician, you know, like it's, you build your identity as you wish. It's not even a thing you generally even choose to build. It just kind of happens to you. Like when somebody says, okay, fill out this profile, you know, your Facebook profile, your Twitter profile, what do you put at the top? That's your identity. Um, and so it's really hard to quit it often, but look about the fact that look at the other facets in your life. You probably aren't just one thing. You're probably not just a husband or wife or whatever else. Um, and then what was the other thing you had just, oh yeah. So being able to, take what you learned along the way is huge. Mm -hmm. Everybody um, who gets caught in thinking about what is called the sunk cost fallacy, which is like, oh, I sunk these years into this. You know, I should sink more years into this or else it's wasted. Yep. Absolutely not. Right. Nothing is wasted. Like they even say this about, you know, people say it a lot more about bad relationships. Like, oh, well, you learned something from that one that you'll take into the next one. But you learn something from everything you're going to take into the next thing, even if it's just that you learned you don't like doing that first thing. You know, I was in a startup. I tried being like the full-time startup entrepreneur. I did not like it. I did not like having zero financial security, um, having to work 24-7. It's like there were just things that were different from a side hustle that were way too out of my comfort zone, too stressful. And it's not like, I don't look at myself as a weak person because I didn't like those. They just weren't for me. And I, mm -hmm. you know, so now if somebody came up and like, would you like to be in my startup? I would have to say no, because I have learned from my, you know, quitting a startup before that that's not for me. So the only way to have wasted any time in something that you later quit is if you learned nothing from it. And I can say with, you know, a lot of certainty that you probably learned something if it's a skill, you know, like, somebody, uh, I called one of my friends the other day and said, oh, this is what I'm doing. You know, I now do this digital media. And he proclaimed, you finally are using your bachelor's degree. <laughs> yes, which is true. You know, like for 20 years, all the skills I learned back in, you know, media communications went dormant. I mean, I could make a great Facebook post, but like, it was not that helpful in, in my career. And now suddenly I'm doing this stuff almost full time. And so it's something I learned years ago. And so if you like, if you want to think, oh, but this is wasted, you don't know in 20 years what you're going to be using and not using. Have yes. faith that, that you did that for a reason. You learned what you, you know, don't, don't ignore the lessons you learned. Like don't go to another startup if you're me and be like, yeah, no, I can do it this time. No, learn from your quits. That's, you know, that's all part of strategic quitting. 
learn from your experiences and learn from your quits so that you're more multifaceted, more skilled, and more able to make decisions in the future that will lead you to things that you're not going to want to quit. Exactly. Making the most informed decision that you can. And, but I think even before that step, it requires an amount of uh, self-awareness, a degree of self-awareness where you're actually, you know, kind of being, you're able to see yourself, you're in the situation, you're able to see yourself and what's happening to you and how you're feeling and what those things mean. Um, you know, so Lynn Marie was able to point to the fact with the startups that it was the, just the hours was one and two was just the instability. It was just kind of two hectic. Some people really thrive in that, you know, but she knows like for herself that that isn't going to work. And I know for myself that that wouldn't work, but you know, the only way that we can kind of know that sometimes is just by paying attention to ourselves and how we're reacting to certain situations. Yeah. That's what I say. I gave a talk at a kind of like a wellness fair a week ago. And I said, this is a self-care skill just the ability to not ignore your body when it's telling you things. Cause it will tell you before anything else that you're in a situation you need to quit. You know, your stomach is ill or you feel anxious. Your heart is for me in medicine. My heart was always racing. And what did I do? I treated it with some drugs instead of like paying attention to like, Oh, you don't actually have a heart condition. You just hate doing this. <laughs> so please pay attention. You know, people are getting better at this, but like the gut feeling is not nothing. There's an entire nervous system in your gut that talks to your brain that is trying to tell you as loudly as it can before you get really sick. Don't do this anymore. Yeah. Jesse says, sometimes the biggest mistakes you make are life's best lessons. Absolutely. So yeah. As long as you learn from them, absolutely they are. Yep. 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 Well, we're going to get ready to wrap up, but I want uh, Lynn Marie to tell us um, what you have going on. Tell us a little bit more about the book and you know what, what's happening in your world. Okay. You well, most importantly. Yeah. Um, I have a website over at quittingbydesign.com. It's the same name as my book. And if you go there, a little pop-up will lead you to my campaign, or we're going to put the campaign in the comments. But currently I am working on pre-selling a book the way that this campaign works. It's kind of a crowdfunding slash publisher attracting campaign through Publishizer, where if I sell enough pre-sell enough copies of the book, a publisher may notice actually at certain levels, publishizer will send it to different publishers to put okay. it in front of them. I've had three publishers interested already. So I'm very excited. Um, you can get your copy of the book there. They start at $15 for an ebook, 20 for a paperback. The book discusses everything we talked about today and more, goes into a lot of detail. Uh, it takes a lot bigger look than we were able to today on just some of the fears about quitting and destigmatizing quitting and more of the preparation. Anyway, if you'd like to pick up a copy of the book, either way, if I get a publisher or not, if I don't, then I will self-publish with the money that I've made from the pre-sale. Either way, you will get a book. Um, and for Side Hustle Success Lab members, anybody who buys any copy of the book, ebook, uh, the paperback, more than one copy, anything, you'll get a 30-minute free session with me to talk about your quits or your goals or evaluate anything you'd like to chat about. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. Oh, happy to do it. And I have a question for you. If I buy a hardback, will you sign it? I, with pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Super cool. Absolutely. So folks, don't forget to head over to that link. You can sign up for, I know uh, Lynn Marie has a newsletter too, so you can keep up with all of her happenings. Um, you know, she's just a super fun lady and somebody that I've known for years and somebody that really stands up in my mind as an example for what's possible when you are willing to be courageous and willing to pursue what's in your heart and do your thing and not worry about what everybody else thinks, because at the end of the day, it's your life. So yes. Lynn Marie is definitely like somebody that just, I, I appreciate so deeply. And thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I thank you for the opportunity to talk to the other hustlers. And I just, if the other hustlers don't know, Tracy is just like next level genius. Like she has given me more marketing ideas. She can better describe my book in a Facebook post than I can. And I wrote it. So learn everything you can from Tracy. She's, she's just like, she is the evil genius at the helm of this. And I <laughs> love it. I just picture you in the lab, like stirring up potions of PR genius. Yeah. So I was Thank so you. happy that I'm a, I am, you know, have the privilege of being your friend, but that you had me on and, and uh, gave me a chance to discuss these things. You're welcome. And you know what? We are long overdue for a Capoeira game. So I know we're not always going to meet in the same hut. It might not be in the same hodas, but we need to set up a time to, to do our thing. Indeed we do. Looking forward to it. All right. You're going to teach me the backflip. <laughs> right after I learn it. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Again, if you have questions for Lynn Marie, please put them in the comments and tag her. She will circle back around. And don't forget about her special offer that's only for this group is if you purchase any copy of the book. She's got the digital version for 15 bucks, hardback for 20 bucks. You get a free 30 minute session with her and you can talk about your quits. You can talk about what's going on in your life, whether maybe you're ready to quit your full time job and take your side hustle full time. Maybe you've got something else going on in your life that you feel you need to quit. Maybe there's something getting in the way of you hitting those big goals. So definitely take her up on that. She's amazing, as you can see. Um, uh, I'm going to sign off now, but Lynn Marie, hang on for one second. Just stay on the, on the okay. call. All right, guys. Have a great day.